this next speaker um, works for the Sepsis Trust. It's going to be a live link. Um, she'll be able to um, hear you, but not necessarily see you. Um, she may come on at the end for a QA and a if she's got time. And this next person um, is called Melissa Mead. She is going to talk briefly about the, the Behrens report, which is not an expert on it, but she's going to talk from personal perspective as a parent who has lost a child through sepsis. And if any of you have got any tissues, I suggest you get them out now because I've seen this and it is quite um, evoking and upsetting, but um, very poignant as well. So I'm going to hand over now to Melissa Mead. Thank you so much. I hope you can all hear me. Um, so as, as Lindy mentioned, I'm, I'm going to talk you through my personal experience of sepsis and it is quite upsetting. So, you know, I can't actually see you, but um, I won't be offended if you need to take a moment for yourself or excuse yourself, because unfortunately I'm not the only person in the world that's lost a child. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen with you now. And I hope you can see my screen. And I hope what you can see on your on your screen is my little boy, William. And um, what's quite poignant about William's story is that, as Lindsay just touched on there, the Behrens report or the Ombudsman report that was published in um, at the back end of 2023 came 10 years after its first report called Time to Act, um, which had significant ramifications and recommendations for the NHS and for the government um, in terms of lessons learned from, from sepsis. And it resulted in a Health Select Committee, it resulted in a sequin and significant changes in framework and regulatory framework around, around sepsis, in the, especially in the acute sector. That was 10 years ago, which was published in the same year that, that William died. And 10 years on, I happened to peer review their, their second report. And unfortunately, lessons are still not being learned. And it's really disheartening for me, as, as what I called it myself, a lay person, um, to know that he died 10 years ago and there are people that are still dying now in the same circumstance from the same mistakes. So I'm going to talk you through William's story and, and, and you will be able to understand the mistakes that were made yourself, I think, really. Um, so let me introduce you. So this is William. Um, this photo was taken when he was 10 months old. And he was born in a circumstance that's what's known as an unremarkable baby. Um, so I had my baby. I went into hospital. I came home. He was he came home and we were fine. So there were no no pregnancy complications, no birth complications. And he developed um, hitting all the milestones as, as he, you anticipate. Um, we spent nine months of maternity leave off off work and. The only thing that he ever really had during those nine months is he was known as the Gaviscon kid because he just didn't like to keep his milk down. But it was becoming less of a problem as he aged and, you know, his body um, developed. And I started work in the September 2014 and William started nursery. And within, I would say, a week of being in nursery, um, which I would say are germ fests. Um, kids lick each other and poke each other in places that they shouldn't. And he was just full of cold, full of snot, um, eyes running, you know, e everything. And I kind of anticipated that, you know, he hadn't really mixed with lots of other children or people up until that point. It was probably a, a few days later that I noticed that it looked like he was struggling to swallow. And, um, Obviously, at 10 months old, I couldn't ask him if his throat was sore. I couldn't really, you know, ask him to, you know, open his mouth so I could see if his throat was sore. So I said to Paul, his dad, I'm going to take him into the, um, going to take him into the doctors and just have him checked over. So we went into the doctors and he examined his throat and he was actually really surprised that William wasn't more poorly because he had really bad tonsillitis. So he was given antibiotics. The next day he came out in scarlet fever. So we had a video consultation and they could see that the rash was sort of that pinprick red rash on, on top of the skin rather than a meningococcal rash. And he was on the right antibiotics. So we kept him off of nursery for about a week. Um, he was quite tired, but he was not, you know, he was only he was only sort of 10, 11 months old. So that, you know, kids at that age aren't woe is me. As soon as they can start playing, they start playing and they bounce back. So he went back to nursery and he he was fine. 
within a week, he started coughing. And it was now what I know to be called a self-limiting cough. So he would sort of <coughs> and then get on with it. It didn't disturb him. It didn't stop him playing or eating, didn't keep him up at night. But I noticed it was there. And I, I suppose after a few days or a week had passed, I said to Paul, have you noticed that William's got a bit of a cough? And he said, oh, I have. But it doesn't seem very bad. So I said, well, we'll leave it a few more days and see how it goes and then maybe take him in. And so that's exactly what I did. And the doctor examined him, listened to his chest, looked in his ears, looked in his throat, no temperatures, otherwise well. And he said, look, you're a first time mum. You're bound to be worried. Um, he's just got a viral cough. You know, we're heading into November now and he's at nursery heading into winter. He's bound to sort of pick up these sort of viral infections. So I thought, right, OK. And I was quite happy with that. I kind of anticipated that I didn't expect him to be diagnosed with anything because he he was well, you know. And I suppose it was probably another week or so. And I noticed that he was coughing more frequently and for longer periods of time. And he started waking up in the night coughing. So I said to Paul, I think I'm going to take him back. It's It's not really gone away and it's got worse. So I went in and saw the same doctor. Now we live in Cornwall and um, we ordinarily, you would be blessed to see the same doctor every time because of the continuity of care. But unfortunately for us, it was to be our downfall. And he was examined by the doctor and his chest was clear, ears clear, throats clear, no temperatures, everything else is fine. And I was told again, you know, you're very worried. You're a first time mum. And you know, I'm I'm a second time mum now and I'm equally as worried. So I, I, I didn't realise at the time I, I felt quite patronising. But, you know, I suppose looking back, it does feel like that. And so we were sent home again. Now, we celebrated his first birthday, which happens to be my birthday. I had him on my birthday and it was at this sort of we had a little lunch for everyone. And it was at this party that I noticed that I said to Paul, he looks like he's lost weight and he was pulling himself up around the furniture. He'd just taken his first step. So Paul said, I've noticed that as well. Maybe it's because he's, you know, a bit more active now. Anyway, it was the next morning that William ate some toast and then he coughed so much he was sick. And it wasn't a tummy bug sick. I think we all know what that looks like. It was literally that he had just eaten his toast. He coughed and he brought his toast up. But I said to Paul, that's not right. It's not right that he's coughing, that he's, you know, he then didn't want to eat his breakfast, you know. So I decided to call the doctor and I went back in and I asked to see a different doctor this time. And I didn't necessarily at the time have any doubt in the first doctor. I just thought a different pair of eyes on him might make a difference. I don't know. And I'd only just got through the door and just sort of sat down when the lady said to me, oh, I can see from the previous doctor's notes that this is a viral infection. You know, now I look back and there was so much confirmation bias and I said, well, are you going to examine him? So she examined him and I can I can see her face. I can hear her voice. I can I can smell the room. You know, it's so vivid. And she said, oh, I can hear some crackles on his chest. And I said, would well, you think he should have antibiotics? This cough's been going on for about eight weeks now. And she said, no, I don't think so. The sounds sort of reverberate off of that upper respiratory tract. And I said, well, he's just not right. And this morning he was sick. And, you know, he said, she said, well, little tummies are very small. And if he's coughing and she recognised that we've got a, a strong family history of, of asthma. So I have brittle asthma. My dad had brittle asthma and we've got terrible lungs in the family. So she prescribed a Ventolin inhaler and she said to give him that before he eats, before he goes outside, you know, the change in the temperature in the air before he goes to bed. And um. So I thought, right, OK, well, you know, that that's something. So we took him home with one of those little aero chambers with the mask. And William was a really placid baby. And this is quite relevant later. And he would tolerate the mask on his face. He would take the inhaler as well as a one year old would. And, you know, Arthur, William's younger brother, is quite feral or spirited. Let's say spirited. And um, he doesn't want to be touched. He doesn't want the stethoscope on his chest. He doesn't want his hair cut. He was the, he's the polar opposite. But William would tolerate all of these sorts of things. So he took it really, really well. And but it didn't really make a difference. 
and I picked him up from nursery on the um, 11th of December and I took him home and he had spaghetti bolognese and he was covered in it and so I took him for a bath and then we built a den and we had all the pillows and all the quilts and all of the cushions and it was the last time that I ever I ever really heard him belly laugh and that night I woke up and he was I woke up to him crying and his little cheeks were bright red and he was dribbling and his little fists were going in his mouth and he was cutting five teeth at the time so he was um I, I gave him some cow pole and I cuddled him and he went back to sleep you know the next morning he woke up and he didn't he, he pushed his food around the plate and I couldn't tempt him with strawberries or blueberries so I said to Paul, as it's a Friday, I said, oh, I'm going to I think I'll keep William off nursery today. But as soon as I said the word nursery, he crawled towards the front door. He, he picked up his little shoes and sort of waved them about. And that was his little thing. So I said to Paul, maybe he'll feel better when he's, you know, he's at nursery with his little friends and he's playing. So I took him into nursery and I said that he'd, he'd had cowpaw about 1 a.m. So he could have some more if he was, you know, feeling unsettled with his teeth. So I got a phone call about 11 to say that he'd refused his morning snack and he was really tired and that they'd taken his temperature and it was 38 and so they'd given him some cow pole and put him down for a nap and I said look as soon as he wakes up give me a call and I'm going to come in and get him I get a phone call about half past 11 to say that he's still not woken up um but his temperature is now 38.4 so I said look I'm coming in I'm going to come in and get him so on the way on the car phone I I called the doctor and I said that, you know, he's had this cough for about 10 weeks now. It's getting worse and the inhaler's not made any better. He's he's not eating. He's really gone off his food. He's got this temperature. He's, you know, he's just not right. And the lady said, the receptionist said that um, there were no appointments. It was Friday. Um, and I said, well, he really needs to be seen. And she said, well, you know, the duty doctor's also full. And I said, well, what about taking him in, you know, taking him to A&E? And we've only got one A&E down here in Cornwall. Um, and I didn't know at the time that they were on Opal 4 or Black Alert. or Unless you had arterial spray, you were not coming in the front door type thing. And But she said, I can hear your concern. So look, take him home and then come and bring him in sort of at the end of the day. And we'll just tack you on to the end. So we took him home. You can see from this photo that he's really uncomfortable really miserable his lips are bright pink he's snotty he's just not himself he's he's just lost all of that color and so we managed to get into the doctors i think it was about 5 40 and by the time we got in there his temperature was 40.1 and and he was combative um, he was not himself at all. He did not want to be touched. He did not want the stethoscope on his chest. He did not want the thermometer in his ear. And it took a while to calm him down. And I said, he's just not right. Something's just not right. And anyway, I managed to calm him down. And they listened to his chest and they said it's entirely clear. Looked in his ears, they're clear. His throat's clear. And he just recognised that he had this really high temperature. And he said, look, he said, it's likely just a viral infection coupled with teething. He's just feeling really unwell, really grotty. Take him home. He'll be right as rain, you know, for the next couple of days. Get on top of the temperature and he'll be fine. So as we walked out the door, I went back in and I said to him, I said, when should we take him in? You know, like because this is the weekend, and he said, "Don't worry, it's nothing grisly." We were given no what I now to be called safety netting advice. I wasn't told what worse looked like. I was just told that get on top of the temperature and he'll be fine. And so we went home and we bought supplies of Nurofen and Calpol on the way, and I put him to bed. And I went into him a couple of times in the night, and his temperature wasn't getting as high now. And so I thought that's good. We're sort of cracking that temperature. He slept in a little bit on Saturday, um, but as Saturday progressed, I couldn't tempt him with anything. He wouldn't have any milk, any water, an ice pop. He didn't want to eat. He hadn't eaten since Thursday. Um, he was not interested in playing, interested in anything like, uh, you know, the TV or singing. or, or uh, He just wasn't interested. And as the day progressed, he seemed so much worse. And... I said to Paul that even though his temperature's coming right down now, he's just so much worse. 
And this this photo, we've got him here on the on the sofa and we had to put the quilt on there because he didn't he wouldn't tolerate clothes like it was a challenge to have this vest on him. It was almost like he just didn't want to be touched. And I said, I'm going to ring 111 because he's just not right. Something's not right. And Paul said, my goodness, they're going to think you're neurotic. And I said, yeah, but look at him. He's not right. So I called 111 and they asked me to take his temperature three times during the phone call to get an average. And it was 35.4. And they said, that's good. You've got on top of his temperature. I said, he's not been to the toilet since Thursday. He's not, I've not had to change his nappy today. And they said, well, if he's not eating and drinking, he's, he's not going to be going to the toilet. I said that he felt really quite cold, like clammy and his arms and his. And they said, well, if he won't tolerate any clothes on him, he's bound to feel a bit chilly. I said that he's really pale. And he's just not interested in eating. And they said, well, you know, when you're feeling a bit down and you're, you've got a viral infection, you feel like that too. And they played this phone call out at the inquest. And they could hear William in the background making like a, like a whining, high-pitched like noise that had never made before. And they said that he's just bound to be whining if he's not feeding very well. And at the inquest, the paediatrician said, if he'd heard that phone call, he would have known that that was a child in respiratory distress. And so our disposition was a, a non-urgent six hour callback. And we were busy faffing, or Paul was, because we were due to get married on the Monday. And we were then due to drive to Spain on the Tuesday to spend Christmas and New Year with my family. And so I just sat with him on the sofa and I was just cuddling him. And this is the last photo that I have of me and William alive. And you can see here his lips are completely devoid of colour. Anyhow, I put him to bed at about seven. And anyone that's got children know that you stealth out of the room to try and not wake them up. And I stood there and I said, good night, sweetheart. I love you. And they were the last words that he ever heard me whisper. And so I stood at the end of his bed and I thought, you're not right. Something, something's not right. It's not sitting right with me. So I went downstairs and I called 111 back and I asked to speak to a doctor. And I had to wait for quite a while until I was patched through to our sort of local out of hours. And one of the first things he said to me on the phone was that he had a waiting room full of people and that he was really busy. And I thought, Quite, you know, I better get on with it. And I said that he'd not he'd had this really high temperature yesterday over 40 and now it's 35 and he said that's good you've got on top of the temperature he's bound to feel better soon I said that he's not been to the toilet he's not eating or drinking and he he reiterated that he's not going to be going to the toilet if he's not eating or drinking and that we don't feel like eating when we're poorly and they played this phone call out at the inquest and I said in these words in these exact in this in in this tone I said, in your professional opinion, what do you think I should do? Because he was being very reactive and I was being very proactive. So I was leading all the questions and saying, but what about this? And but what about this? And what? And he just said, look, he, the best place for him is in bed with plenty of fluids, cowpaw if needed, and, and plenty of rest. He'll be right as rain in the morning. So, so I am. Um, so that night I checked on him when I went to bed at about 11 and he was snoring and and then I went in at about one and he was sleeping soundly and I heard some rustling at about five o'clock and we had one of those little baby spying monitors and I could see that he was taking a drink from his sippy cup so I thought that's good he's really thirsty he's gonna wake up in a few hours and he's gonna want some porridge or something anyway I woke up just after eight or nearly half eight actually and I thought crikey that's late and William was facing away from the camera and so I, I went to the loo and I, I didn't have my glasses on and I opened his bedroom door and I could smell that he'd been to the toilet and I thought that's really odd like he he doesn't go to the toilet in the night anymore he's you know he'd gone beyond that and I was talking to him and I was saying William William and he just didn't babble back to me he didn't say mum 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 
and I went over to his cot and I, we've got blackout blind in there so I couldn't really see anything and I stroked his cheek and it was warm but he didn't move and I knelt down and I put my arm through the bar of the cot and I stroked his arm which was quite cold but he didn't stir and I stroked his side and he was stiff and I shot up and I opened the blinds and I could see that he had he was dead he'd obviously died and his eyes had fallen open and he was staring straight through me and I just started screaming to Paul he's dead he's dead he's not breathing and I ran into the bedroom to get to get the telephone to call 999 and then Paul ran in the bedroom and he just started screaming and he lifted William out of the cot and he placed him on the floor and I started CPR and I can hear the call handler going and one and two and three and four and one and two and I couldn't open his mouth to give him rescue breaths because he was in rigour and so the paramedics come thundering up the stairs at about it was three it's three minutes and 44 seconds because I was staring at this woman's voice in the in the phone and we you could see the ambulance station from our house it was a Sunday morning and after seven minutes he said he turned to me and he said I'm sorry my love but he's gone and I just started screaming and he held me so that I didn't fall down the stairs and as I calmed down I just laid with William on his bedroom floor with my cheek on his and I begged him to wake up knowing that he never would and we were conveyed to hospital where he had lots of tests and then they took this photo this is our reality this is the reality of not thinking sepsis it is the reality of unfortunately thousands of people every year who die when they don't need to die this is the last photo that i have of me and william i was only able to hold him 15 more times after this photo was taken and I'll skip that on and he was I can probably stop sharing now although you probably see my face and so he was taken away to Birmingham for a post-mortem and then on Christmas Eve the coroner called and she said we've got William's body back for Christmas and she said did William have a cough and I laughed like a nervous laugh. I was like, goodness, yeah, he'd had a cough for weeks. How how do you know? And she said, well, he had pneumonia. And I said, what do you mean he had pneumonia? I said, I took him into the doctors about cough so many times. Um, what transpired, what happened to William is in the weeks leading to his death, he had a bacterial chest infection. And had he been prescribed a course of antibiotics, the likelihood is he wouldn't have developed pneumonia. And even if he had, which obviously some people do, he would have been on the radar, a different course of antibiotics, a hospital admission, a chest X-ray, whatever it might be. But William's pneumonia took over. And when he was seen by the doctor those 36 hours before he died, he had a collapsed lung. He had a pleural effusion, so his left lung cavity was had over 200 mils of viscous fluid in his lung cavity. And I actually spoke to the medical examiner that performed his post-mortem because I just had to understand. And he said there would have been no air movement in his chest, none. There would have been slight dull sounds on the other side. He had heavy inner and outer ear infection and he died of sepsis. I thought, bloody hell, what is that? That must be so rare. You know, I had the one thing I'd looked all over William for was that rash, that meningococcal rash. I'd even looked in between his bum cheeks and in between his toes just in case I'd missed that rash, but there was no rash. And we had to endure an inquest that told us that William could have and should have been saved with better care. 
And after that, there was an NHS England report that found 16 failings in his care and four missed opportunities to save his life. There were a number of issues that were record keeping omissions, um, the uh, you know lack of diagnosis of sepsis or the thought of sepsis and training around sepsis, um, prescription of antibiotics because of antimicrobial resistance, um, not listening to patients. You know, I didn't know what was wrong with William, but I knew he wasn't right. And I said that so many times. So, you know, 10 years on after all the, you know, I, I don't at, in the in the preceding 10 years, there has been so much work that has been done um, and pre pandemic. There was a lot of work done and sepsis treatment was on an upwards trajectory in a positive direction. But I think there has been uh, the priority has changed and the foot has been taken off the gas pedal, as it were. And, you know, to be part of the um, Ombudsman report at the back end of last year and to peer review this, and to read case after case after case where lessons are not being learned, putting lives at risk, sepsis suspected but not acted upon, no, not given antibiotics or a delay in antibiotics, delays in transfers, people not being listened to. And, you know, I find it incredibly disheartening. And, you know, 10 years on, our NHS continues to let down um, too many people with sepsis. And progress has been made in the intervening years and following the report, you know, obviously pre pandemic and post pandemic. But it's clear that significant there is a significant opportunity for greater improvement. Um, and I'm under no illusion that we have a very burdened NHS and doctors get things wrong and people make mistakes. And I am not angry with the doctors that sent William home. I'm not angry with them because they make mistakes and they're human. Forgiveness is something different, I suppose. But what I'm trying to say is that each and every one of you have the ability to play your part, to be have the opportunity to have a positive impact on that patient's life that you're treating. And we are in an NHS where you will have to deliver bad news but be with those people, listen to those people, help them whilst they're in their crisis and they are at their most vulnerable. Always think sepsis and talk to patients about sepsis and help them to understand. Because we need to be able to have compassion. We need to be able to diagnose sepsis much more quickly and when it's suspected, treat it quickly and give people the best chance of a positive outcome that we can have. Um, so I guess that's my parting message today, because, you know, working on this for 10 years and then being part of a report that is showing that the same mistakes are being made now that they were 10 years ago when William died is is quite soul destroying um and it's down to us as individuals to play our part and to have a positive impact on people and i can guarantee you that even in a patient's worst or, or at, when they're at their most vulnerable they will remember you and they will remember your words and your kindness and your time i remember the paramedic's face their, their their smell, their words, everything, because they were so kind to us. So that's all that that's my message to you today. And I um believe that after you, your next um speaker that I'm gonna come back and answer any questions and I'm happy to always answer questions about either William's care or the report or anything that happened after that, or the work indeed that's been done by the Sepsis Trust. Um, Sorry that Dr. Ron Daniels couldn't join you here today, but he's actually in intensive care. So I'll let him off. But um, I hope that today my, my talk has been informative. And, you know, if you can go away and just talk about William to one person, then then I'll be happy. So thank you ever so much um, for your time today. <laughs>